On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first human-made satellite into orbit, named Sputnik. Professional and amateur radio operators could tune in to 20.005 and 40.002 MHz to listen to this signal. Several scientists at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory figured out that they could perform some fancy math on the received Sputnik signal and pinpoint the satellite's orbit around the Earth. This is all due to the Doppler effect. The next year, they figured out the reverse problem. If they knew the satellite's position around the Earth, they could actually pinpoint the receiver's location. This led to the Applied Physics Laboratory working with ARPA, the predecessor to DARPA, to developing the first satellite navigation system known as Transit. Transit was primarily used by the Navy to help ships and submarines navigate. Then, in 1973, a joint group of military officers commissioned a project known as the Defense Navigation Satellite System, which was a superior replacement to transit and other military technologies at the time. This later became known as NAVSTAR, which stands for Navigation System Using Timing and Ranging. However, nowadays we just know it as the Global Positioning System, or GPS. At this time, there are 31 operational satellites flying in orbit around the Earth, about 20,000 kilometers above the surface. The satellite's orbits were calculated so that at any point on the surface of the Earth with a clear view of the sky, you could see at least four satellites. But why four? So glad you asked! As it turns out, you need four satellites to calculate your position on the Earth. To see how this works, let's use a two-dimensional example. Let's say you're taking a road trip across the United States and you're trying to recreate Shadow's journey in American Gods. But you find yourself completely lost, so you stop and ask a stranger where you are. The stranger mysteriously tells you that you're 603 kilometers from Madison, Wisconsin. Well, it's not particularly helpful, as you can be anywhere along the outside of this circle, since any point here is 603 kilometers from Madison. At least that narrows it to a few states. You ask another stranger, and frustratingly, they tell you that you are 246 kilometers from Springfield, Illinois. Not helpful. But if you draw another circle of every point that's 246 kilometers from Springfield, you get two points where it overlaps with the previous circle. So, to be both 603 kilometers from Madison and 246 kilometers from Springfield, you must be in one of those two locations. Finally, we ask a third stranger in this bizarro universe, and they tell you that you are 325 kilometers from Topeka, Kansas. Bingo! We draw a third circle, and we find the point where all three overlap. We're in Jefferson City, Missouri. That's a rather silly example of trilateration, but it's essentially how we can use the known position of satellites to calculate our location on the surface of the Earth. Instead of strangers, we have satellites overhead, each containing a very precise, very accurate atomic clock that broadcasts its exact time once every 30 seconds. When we receive this message, we can compare it to our own clock to see how long it took for the message to arrive. We can determine the distance to the satellite by multiplying the time of flight of the RF signal by the speed of light. Let's assume this blue ball is the Earth, and we're somewhere on the surface of it. Unlike a two-dimensional map, if we know the distance away from a satellite, then we can be anywhere along the outside of a sphere, which I'll color red. Now, if we know the distance away from a second satellite, that produces another sphere of possible locations in space. If we look at the intersection of the red sphere and the green sphere, you'll notice that there's a circle of possible locations. At least we're down to a two-dimensional shape now. So, we add a third satellite, and now we have only two points in space where we could be. Here's the trick. We use the Earth as a fourth sphere, which means that we're probably not floating in the middle of space. With that, we know that we're at this point here, which is the intersection of all four spheres. I know, I know. I told you that you needed four satellites, and I just showed you how you could do it with three. This assumes that your receiver has an onboard atomic clock that has nanosecond precision that you can compare its time versus the received time of the packets from the satellites. However, this is a pricey and bulky proposition for a handheld GPS receiver. But if you include data from a fourth satellite, you can then calculate the time as well as your own position. Every 30 seconds, each satellite broadcasts a message at 50 bits per second. 
The message contains three main parts. The first is the precise date and time on the satellite, along with an indication of the satellite's health. The second is known as the ephemeris, which is information about the satellite's position above the Earth. The third is a piece of what's known as the almanac. The GPS Almanac gives general information about the location of all satellites, which helps receivers determine their location more quickly. Because only a piece of the Almanac data is included in each message, it takes 25 messages to download a full Almanac. That's 12 and a half minutes. Because of the different information that's required, the time for a receiver to calculate its position can vary. A cold start happens when the receiver is brand new, or it's been off for a few months, or it has been moved over 100 kilometers without an update. Because it needs to download a full almanac, getting position data after a cold start can take around 15 minutes according to many manufacturers. A warm start, on the other hand, means that the receiver has valid almanac data and has a general idea of its position and current time. It only needs to download the ephemeris data for the satellites in view, which could take up to a few minutes. Finally, there's the hot start, which means that the receiver has known good ephemeris and almanac data. Calculating a position takes only a few seconds. To help with these times, we can rely on other technologies. For example, many smartphones can use assisted GPS, which downloads almanac and ephemeris data over the cell network, and this greatly decreases the time needed to get a fix. Many modern GPS receivers handle all the calculations for us. All we need to do is give it power and listen over a UART line. This is a GP20U7. I'll plug the red line into 3.3 volts, black into ground, and white into pin 10, which I'll use as a software serial receive pin. Open a new Arduino sketch. At the top, write pound include software serial.h. Under that, software serial soft, open parentheses, 10 comma 11, close parentheses, slash slash rx comma tx. This shows us which pin is for receive and which pin is for transmit. In setup, write serial.begin 9600 and then soft.begin 9600. This particular GPS module continually transmits GPS data over the serial line at 9600 baud in NMEA format. In loop, write string, msg equals soft dot read string until, and then in parentheses, single quotes, backslash r. Each NMEA message ends with a new line in carriage return, so we'll store the entire message up until the carriage return as a string. I know that the string object isn't the most efficient in Arduino, but it makes for easy to follow demo code. Then, write serial.print msg to print the NMEA message to the console. Upload and open a serial monitor. Take your Arduino and GPS outside, and after a few minutes, you should start seeing some real numbers appear in your messages. It turns out that many GPS modules spit out more than simple position data. There's a lot of information in here about the individual satellites that can be seen and the quality of the data. To make this easy, I'll show you the important bits. NMEA stands for National Marine Electronics Association, which was actually a group of electronics dealers that formed in 1957. One of the standards to come out of that group was NMEA 0183, which is what many modern GPS receivers use to communicate position data. All messages in this protocol begin with a dollar sign and end with new line and carriage return characters. Additionally, individual pieces of data are separated by commas. Just after the dollar sign is a two-letter designation for the satellite system. GP means the United States GPS system, and GL would indicate that you're receiving data from GLONASS, which is Russia's version of GPS. Most modern receivers that you can buy in the United States will only receive data from GPS. However, technology is in the works that will allow you to receive from both systems. After that, you'll see a three-letter designation for the type of message. All we really want is the GPGGA message, which is the GPS fixed data. The next number is the time the fix was taken. Note this is universal coordinated time in 24-hour format. Then, we have latitude followed by a letter, N for north and S for south. Note that position data is given in decimal-decimal format, so we need to take the two digits before the decimal number and the digits after it and divide by 60 to get the decimal degree value, which is what you would find in something like Google Maps. 
After that, we have the longitude and a one-letter designation for east or west. The eighth value shows the number of satellites used to calculate this position. We have nine in this example. Then, the tenth value is the elevation above sea level in meters, as shown by the M designator. Note that sea level is estimated based on an assumed ellipsoid model of the Earth. We skipped over several of the values, which could be useful for determining how accurate your data is and if other methods like differential GPS were used to assist in the calculation of the position fix. Differential GPS uses ground stations to broadcast information to ground-based receivers that contains corrective data to make up for inaccuracies in GPS signals. Then there's Wide Area Augmentation System, or WAS, that works similarly to differential GPS, but instead of sending it directly to the receivers, this information is sent to a central location, which is beamed up to a geostationary satellite, and then that information is broadcast down to GPS receivers on the ground. Note that with these corrective measures, GPS has an accuracy up to about 2 to 5 meters. Without it, accuracy decreases to around 5 to 10 meters. Note that this is for horizontal position data only, as altitude data is generally worse. Without corrective measures, altitude can be inaccurate up to 15 to 20 meters. Also note that things like buildings and trees can block your view of the sky and also create other inaccuracies. Because NMEA messages are collections of characters, we can parse them to extract the time and position data that we need. Here, I've created a simple program that prints out the important bits every few seconds. The code for this can be found in the comments. GPS was originally developed by the US military as a tool for navigation and delivering weapon payloads. However, in 1983, a Soviet jet fighter shot down a civilian airliner when it strayed too far into restricted airspace thanks to a navigation error. Thanks to that, President Reagan announced that GPS would be available for civilian use once the project was completed. Nowadays, most of us carry around a super accurate locator in our pockets and self-driving cars are just around the corner. So if you're building an autonomous vehicle, GPS is a strong contender as a navigational tool. With that, happy hacking, fellow roboticists. Differential, some fancy math, position or in uh, to be create thanks to a then in 19 that stands for navigation system using math on the specific